And welcome to Literary Merit, the show where we tell you what media has value. Spoiler alert, it's all of it. Also, spoiler alert, we're talking some spoilers about all this. <laughs> I'm Ashley. And I'm Alex. And today we have in the studio Dylan Hall, a.k.a. Zoodle. Say hi. Uh, hi, I'm, <laughs> I'm Ashley's brother. <laughs> He's my brother. That's my profession. <laughs> <laughs> professional brother so uh so why are you here (laughs) yeah why are you here because you asked me to i am here because i have played more video games than i can probably count um (laughs) i can vouch for that (laughs) and um i do enjoy you know thinking about them in a more as a uh as a medium for entertainment rather than just you know toys or games i like to think of them as a different avenue for people to take when they're creating content so well you're in good company (laughs) (laughs) yeah i I see it as a separate medium from from film and literature and things like that it's just its own thing yeah definitely and i'm sure we're gonna talk plenty about that today Uh, But first, I'll ask, what is new with you, Alex? Uh, not a lot, actually. (laughs) Once normally I, like, take up, like, 20 minutes of our recording time for just one thing that leads to a tangent, but... (laughs) Some Alex anecdote. Yeah, or, like, I don't know, we we talked about a bunch of different things last week, but, yeah, nothing really... No, not up to anything? Yeah. Oh, that's okay. You've been been working. I have, oh my goodness. (laughs) I finally have two jobs, and now I'm understanding what that means. <laughs> because yeah. even if even if it's not like even if I don't have both jobs in one day, it usually means that I'm working every day mm-hmm. with no day off. And and so I think I'm on. I don't know. That's why I'm so worn out, and I can't read the script right (laughs) (laughs) yes to our listeners out there we had a bit of a snafu getting started but we should be okay now (laughs) one might call it a kerfuffle something like that yes (laughs) well isn't a kerfuffle a fight i I don't it's a lot of things i don't know we could argue about (laughs) definitions all day (laughs) i have i have very strange definitions for words that don't necessarily have a concrete meaning uh, yeah, no, we had a we had a word melee. <laughs> <laughs> we had a fracas, if you will. <laughs> All right. Well, anyway, um, well, Dylan and I decided to go out and visit our neighborhood parks on uh, Friday, and that was really fun. That's true. Legion, Legion and Park. That's the one with the dinos in it. It is. The... And cent- Centennial? Centennial. And then what was the terrible park with the standing water? Settlemeyer. Settlemeyer. Don't, if you're ever in Woodburn, Oregon, don't go to Settlemeyer Park. You might die. <laughs> you might die of sepsis. It's, it, it is as close to a swamp <laughs> as I've ever seen a park be. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and it's like a real park. Like it's got like benches and like it has gazebos. a de- decent swing set. It had actually a nice skate park. If you skate, yeah. that's the place to go. But otherwise, you stay away from the grassy areas. Lots of gnats. Lots of standing water. <laughs> it's a swamp next to a skate park, and they call it a park. I, I don't agree. <laughs> no, yeah, that was bad. But it was such a lovely day. We had to get out and do something. Yeah. We wanted to go to the library, but for some reason it was closed on, at like five thirty in the afternoon. Yeah, that's dumb. <laughs> it was dumb. It was really dumb. But uh, the other thing that Dylan and I have been doing more recently is playing ukulele. That's true. I have. And, and for our listeners, that is not the instrument. No, oh, no, no, no. <laughs> not the ukulele instrument, but the video game ukulele. Um, so that that game was. Uh, this is uh, going to lead right into our topic today. That that game was uh, developed by Rare, correct? Uh, 
sort members of, of rare members of rare so um for the uninitiated rare was a video game development company back sort of in the 90s they made banjo kazooie most famously golden eye oh they didn't okay maybe golden eye <laughs> most famously <laughs> but banjo kazooie is going to be our touchstone uh right now because ukulele is just banjo kazooie again <laughs> It is, and they already made Banjo Tooie. <laughs> are you how, how familiar are you with uh, Banjo Kazooie and ukulele, Alex? Um, my neighbors growing up had Banjo Kazooie, and I would watch them play it all the time because I didn't have a Nintendo sixty four, um, and it was it was very fun to watch. And then I, I I'm, I've been not like following the the development of ukulele intensely but i i know what it is i know i've seen people play it so i i'm pretty i'm pretty familiar with both okay cool so what were your initial thoughts dylan when uh, playing ukulele when playing ukulele um it no it did hit me in the nostalgia bone it like <laughs> right in the nostalgia bone yeah it was painful where, where, um, where, where is that bone uh, I can't talk about that on a, <laughs> a family on podcast. On a family podcast, but um, <laughs> a very anatomically sensitive place. <laughs> but uh, it, um, you know, it did. It took me back to when I first booted up Banjo Kazooie on the N sixty four when I rented it from Blockbuster Video. Oh my god, we had that and, rented for so and long and forgot to bring it back for like two and a half months. <gasps> It was, and we just had it paused too. We didn't even like turn the console off, so it was just like twenty four hours a day, like. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Grant Kirkup. <laughs> oh, Grant Kirkup. Um, and it it yeah, it did take me back, and I was excited. I I wanted to see what uh, the original team that that kind of got the ball rolling on collectathons of the N64 yeah. era. Collectathon 3D platformers. Exactly. Um, yeah. You know, they followed Mario 64 quite spectacularly in terms of, like, the first 3D platformers. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wanted to see what can they do now? Like, that's... These people innovated in a way that few can dream of. <laughs> <laughs> what What can they do again? Uh, turns, and out. turns out uh, uh, they can make Banjo Kazooie again. Um, but okay, here's what I wonder though. They're pretty good at making Banjo Kazooie. <laughs> like, <laughs> I wonder though that if that's really just all they were trying to do. It is. I think it is. I and think they probably could have done something else, but I think that they may have been afraid to deviate. Because what they were doing was saying, like, hey, everybody, remember the thing that you loved when you were eight? Well, here is it, it is again. You're 25. <laughs> yes. <laughs> like, here's... Well, wasn't, wasn't ukulele crowdfunded? It was. And, and I think so... that's probably why, it, why they didn't deviate very much, is because they were trying to please everybody. Exactly. Yeah. And, and in doing so, they did. You know, they, they did please a lot of people who just wanted to play banjo kazooie again and uh and it really is like it watching really him is. play it, just down like all the little details like the way that the the character voices work you know like <laughs> it is oh let me tell you i didn't know when i was a child just how annoying that is you know what i remember as a child is how annoying our parents thought that was <laughs> and now that we are adults and we know what annoying things are it's annoying. It's really bad too. <laughs> yeah, and so what I don't understand is why didn't they just do like the weird talking for like the first line of of the the dialogue and then just let us read it? Well, you can skip. You can skip it. <laughs> you can just skip to the end. Not during cutscenes, though. Not during cutscenes. During cutscenes, because it's timed specifically to go along with the cutscene, you're not allowed to skip through it, and so you hear every. Little <laughs> syllable. Oh, oh, is it timed because the voices need to match the lips? <laughs> yeah, we've Pretty got much. lip flaps yes. to worry about here. It's very important. Yeah. Yeah. To, no, it's just because. The gibberish. Yeah, because the you know a cutscene is like animated and everything. <clears throat> yeah, so. it's pre-recorded, and so they couldn't, they can't trigger animations based on dialogue, mm -hmm. which is how they would normally do it. 
But yeah, there's just a lot to it that's very much the same. Like, just a lot of your little abilities and stuff are just straight out of Banjo-Kazooie. Like, they didn't even come up with anything new. It's just instead of a bear and a bird, it's a chameleon, chameleon and a bat. And like, a bat. is he a chameleon? He is a chameleon. Does later he do on, any chameleon stuff? Later on, yes. He does get an ability where he turns invisible. Well, that's new, at least. Yes. That's that is... new. But, like, all, like, basically everything that you need to learn to do in Banjo-Kazooie, it's there. And, yep. and, okay, here's what I need to say about ukulele. It's scary. <laughs> How is it it's... scary? <laughs> <laughs> Dylan's been laughing about this since we first started playing it. But, yeah. no, it's, like, there. it's really surreal. Like, oh. certain characters just, like... And maybe if I were to go back to Banjo Kazooie, I would feel that way about it, but I don't think so because I'm remembering it just being a lot more sort of cohesive um, than Ukulele seems to be. There's just a lot of very different kinds of characters going on. It doesn't feel like a a, a really coherent theme, but but moreover, a lot of these little guys that you come across are just really frightening to me like they just really bother me <laughs> okay what are those weird little ghost guys you have to collect i can't remember what they are they are the ghosts of the people who wrote the book that you get and Laylee collecting the pages yeah, from you're collecting the pages from and they're scary ghosts they're really weird looking a like a couple of them are genuinely like that's a effed up ghost <laughs> <laughs> like, this one is just like a big mouth He's just this maw that you have to feed, and it's really upsetting. And it's and it just feels like, <laughs> where did this come from in this game? They are cartoon ghosts. Yeah, okay, yeah. I mean, they, <laughs> like the art style, I guess, but it is 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 reasonable. But it's just like, what is this doing here? Like, what what is any of this doing in this game? There's just a lot. There's like this octopus lady. I don't really care for her character design. But yeah, it's not great. There's just a lot of very disparate stuff there in is. it. And I think I would have to go back and play it again. But I, I feel like in Banjo Kazooie, that was a thing, but it was cohesive for the level that you were on. The levels were themed. Yes. You go on a pirate level and you talk to a pirate hippo. And, and it's all pirate There's stuff. a pirate crab, and like everyone's a pirate. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's, it's kind of weird that there's a hippo on a beach. Hippos are aquatic Hi animals. Yeah, but they, they're in the, like, the jungle and stuff. They're not, <laughs> they don't go onto the beach. They're not saltwater. <laughs> saltwater hippo. They're not saltwater hippos. <laughs> and so it's weird for him to be on a pirate ship. <laughs> I guess so. But there's much weirder stuff in ukulele. True. Um, but I, I guess that, I, I mean, I'll chalk up all of that to just feeling like they want to, you know, try something new, do something different, yeah. get some interesting character designs in there. And there's some very interesting stuff. And then there's a... Trouser. There's Trouser, the snake. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> yeah, he's he's in a, he's got a pair of pants. He so his I mean, I love trouser. what they did to make him fill the pants. I, <laughs> I like the way he wears clever. them. But the fact that that's his name... Well, and he keeps pulling things out the pants, too. What does he have in his... He's, like, he carries stuff around in there. He does, yeah. It's weird. Uh, but he there's, like, a phone. there's like a sentient vending machine that doesn't even look like a vending machine. I'm not exactly sure what she is. She vends things to you. Yeah. She gives you what... They're called, like, tonics or something. They're basically, like, cheat codes from the original. Yeah. Um, they will give you a small boost to something you know one of them will be you use less energy when you're sprinting or uh, i can't remember the other ones you deal more damage i think was one of them you have an extra hit point that kind of stuff yeah but i mean overall it just, just feels like more banjo kazooie right it does yeah and, and i i have talked to a couple of friends of mine about that and they were like yeah isn't that awesome uh <laughs> and so I, I don't know if I can really fault it for it, but in my opinion, I, I just, I guess I had a high expectations. I had high hopes. For something new. For something new. At least to advance upon a genre that they initiated. You know, or at they, least sort of, like, were the pinnacle of. Yeah. They kind of pioneered, you know, that. Oh, certainly a lot of it. Yeah. Yes. 
a lot of things that became staples of that genre. And I, I want them to do it again. <laughs> They're out of juice. From what I've seen, it, it looks like they sort of keep it really familiar at first. And then does it get a little a little different as, as you keep playing? A little bit. I haven't actually finished it. So I, I probably shouldn't be doing a podcast about it at all. <laughs> That's okay. But... We did a whole podcast episode about a movie neither of us have seen. So you're okay. Yeah. That's how we do it here on Literary <laughs> Merit. Educated guesses. I'm not as educated as either of you. At least you played the game. I did. <laughs> So I, uh, I've been reading some articles. Um, I found this really interesting one sort of about the psychology of nostalgia, um, especially as it relates to video games and sort of why, because, you know, we really wanted to talk about this because there's just, there's just a whole lot of this kind of thing coming out these days, whether it's, you know, something like ukulele, which is very specifically saying like, look, it's this thing that you used to do, um, and sort of other games a lot of indie games sort of riffing on retro styles um it seems like pretty much everything is a remake or a sequel <laughs> um i was looking into some some statistics so um overwatch was blizzard's first game not based on starcraft warcraft or diablo since 1997 wow Everything Whoa. they've done since 1997, before Overwatch, was StarCraft, WarCraft, or Diablo. 20 years? And, and, and then yeah, like, 20 I'm years! Just imagining, wow. I'm just imagining them, and they're like, oh, we gotta stick to our guns, and then they come out with this new thing, and it's like, oh, it's kind of bigger than all of this those This is the right best now. thing we've ever done, turns out. <laughs> um, but Splatoon was Nintendo's first new, like, big in, uh, intellectual property in 14 years. Whoa. Yeah. Like, everything else that they had come out with was just sequels to other stuff that they had made. Uh, so, clearly, like, this is a thing, like, and, you know, we're seeing it not just in video games, but in movies. Everything is Absolutely. a sequel, everything is a remake, everything is an adaptation, like, we're not... <laughs> when did Jurassic World come out? That was pretty recent. Yeah, that was a year or last two ago. Year. Yeah, last, last year. year. So, uh, anyway, I was reading this this article about sort of the psychology of nostalgia and a lot of the time nostalgia is really good for coping with stress uh you know oh. the idea that it, it's sort of comfort food for your brain uh, well, that's making a lot of sense now for how all of media is going since yeah we're just yeah. really stressed out and we just <laughs> yeah. want some we want I would the say, entertainment I would say, equivalent of mashed potatoes right now. I would say without any evidence backing this up that we are probably one of the most stressed out generations in history. Yes, I mean, I, it o certainly feels than, that way. Other than generations that had, like, world wars to deal with. Yeah, yeah. and who knows, maybe we'll get to be one of them. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. Um, well, that's, that's really interesting then, that it is sort of comparing it to comfort food. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a that was a really apt, I think, comparison there about. Yeah, I mean, I think it aren't comfort foods comfort foods because they you are nostalgic for them when you were a kid. Yeah, it's you know your mom's chicken soup. It's you know grandma's mashed potatoes. Yeah. And so on the cooking side of it, of, it, it, it's something you know how to cook. You know. Yeah. You something you know, tried and true, and, just, and yeah. maybe not always good for you. Yeah. <laughs> so that's an interesting uh, dimension to that metaphor. But um, another th uh, point that they brought up was this really interesting study, um, which, and I'll, I'll link this article, so I'm not going to try super hard to, like, represent it scientifically and accurately. You guys can <laughs> read it for yourselves. But um, basically, the conclusion that they came to was that um, they, like, made people feel lonely. Like, they made them feel isolated and lonely, and then showed them products... Um, like newer products and then like vintage products and they felt more drawn to the vintage products when they were lonely and then actually experiencing nostalgic things so like eating cookies that were popular when they were kids or whatever made them then feel less lonely and wow. so nostalgia is a very like social thing um 
you're, you're most nostalgic about things that you experience with other people. You oh, tend definitely. not to be nostalgic for things that were solo experiences. Yeah, I was. I've been listening to a lot of stuff that we listened to as kids. Yeah, lots of music. Oh boy, all of these like late '90s, early 2000s jams exactly. up in the computer room right now. Toxic by Britney Spears every <laughs> single day. Every single day we listen to Toxic. You're welcome <laughs> for that gift I've given you every day for the past uh, several weeks. But um, That's another me of um, Bill Nye's new show. Yeah, I haven't watched any of it. Mm. How is it? No, I I've seen a couple episodes, and I think it's it's one of those shows where even though he is just qualified, completely qualified to to run that show and to like do interviews and stuff, I think that show is definitely powered by nostalgia because mm. I mean we all grew up, and whether we liked it or not, we watched Bill Nye because it was usually a public. Who- who didn't Classroom. like it though, yeah, exactly. Alex? Who didn't like it? Tell me that. Well, no, I'm not Did saying. You? I'm not saying. You know that. You know, we just for, we for, all saw for it. Better or for ill, we all saw it. <laughs> well, yeah, we just all saw it. It was almost inescapable in public school. Yeah. And watching the show or his new show, Bill Nye Saves the World, I don't know. It it's really weird because it's directed at us still. The same. The generation same generation that, that he was speaking to in the 90s, in the early 2000s. Mm -hmm. So has his narrative us. changed? You know, is he... Yeah. So his ah. so everything's directed at 25-year-olds. So it's like huh. he's making sex jokes, <laughs> and and it's not, like, it's just cringeworthy at some points. Is it? And <laughs> especially because there's a live studio audience. I didn't actually know that. It's it's a little weird. Um, he's still great, but I don't know because it's like this weird sort of live format. His timing's a little bit off. It's it just isn't gonna be edited the way that yeah. like a studio produced thing would yeah. be. Yeah, and 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 that's I think what's bugging me the most. And it, hmm. again, it I, it's somehow having to do with this nostalgia. Like they changed it a little bit, and now I don't like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, so that's really interesting. Um. And 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 I think this sort of relates to the the ukulele discussion. Another thing about nostalgia is that we really tend to sort of forget the less good parts, and we really oh, only yeah. remember the happy bits. Um, they the, apparently this is called fading effect bias, where you're just better at remembering things that are happy and worse at remembering things that are unpleasant. I mean that's kind of nice though that our brains like okay we're gonna we're gonna fondly remember the good things. Just get the highlights real. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder if that was an evolutionary trait or if you know it's inherent. Yeah, I don't. I don't really know. I, I didn't read why that exists. It was yeah. just sort of dropped it in there. It was like this is a thing. Tune in next week when we uh, have a psychologist as a guest. <laughs> yeah. To help you us know figure any of those? <laughs> But yeah, absolutely, and I, and I think, um, you know, I mean, that that has a lot to do with, you know, why we just really enjoy looking back on, you know, because it's like, you know, you think about hooking up your LAN to play Doom, and it's like, yeah, but that was actually really irritating to try to do, right? <laughs> and like typing in IP addresses, and it's just like not, not a good process, but you forget about those bits, and you just remember like shooting up monsters with your friends and that's that's cool and so i'm not sure where i'm going with this <laughs> <laughs> you know talking about the bill nye thing why do you think it is that it's uncomfortable to see those childhood figures in those sorts of adult i think i think it's situations. partially that we have to uh come to terms with them aging mm -hmm. Maybe. But I think that might be a little part of it. I mean, he still looks exactly the same, just with gray hair. But it's like, it almost, I wonder if it's it's, it's like, more kind of an issue of like it feels like it's your grandpa saying stuff, and you're like, no, not yeah, you. Yeah, I think. But I think again, why do you, why do we not like that? Well, because we're. I, I think it's just a socialization thing where we're just taught like, don't mix those 
things. You know, yeah. you don't... It's it's weird to talk about, like, sex stuff with your grandpa. <laughs> Just don't do it. And so when you view these other figures in that way, like if Mr. Rogers yeah. was to be <clears throat> saying some stuff, you'd be like, no, not Mr. Rogers, because he's my dear elderly friend. Yeah, and that's exactly what I, I mean. It's like that, those sorts of figures that were, like, those fatherly... Yeah. Those... Just, you know, those child idols. Uh, oh, I have a great a great game to talk about in terms of that. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of... My, my second console that I ever got was a PS2, because we arrived late to the game, to the whole <laughs> video game thing. Um, and one of my favorite games for that was Jack and Daxter. Oh, boy. Jack and Daxter, yeah. that's a good one. It is. Yeah, and that's another great, you know, platformer collecting game yeah it was Um, definitely mm -hmm. late in the sort of evolution but it was like one of the last real good yeah it was animal mascot games it was it was really interesting because it it also arrived right on the cusp of like edgy 2000s stuff yeah because well and 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 that's the evolution of the series exactly it 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 gets darker sequels the second (laughs) one (laughs) yeah gets a gun yep right away (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, and, and it's like there's flying cars, and you crash and kill people, and it's like GTA almost. Yeah, and it was fun, but like, why? <laughs> Who thought of that? It was it was Shadow the Hedgehog. He was behind it all. <laughs> Not him. The chaos. Emerald. Yeah. Now that's an interesting one to sort of track the evolution of, because it man of edginess in video games. Well, and just sort of like the 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 way that video games developed, because like he was like. Animal mascot numero uno, like he was the guy. Sonic. Yeah, Sonic, and yeah. and just to to sort of track the evolution of the Sonic franchise through the years is a pretty fascinating exercise. Um, and and so that's one. So and this other article that I read was it was talking about Crash Bandicoot, and say it was something where because there was like there's new Crash Bandicoot something or other. But they were saying, you know, people were like, oh boy, nostalgia for Crash Bandicoot. And uh, they were thinking, like, well, wait, like, can I, he, he, I guess they they ended up questioning, like, can you be nostalgic for something that never went away? Crash Bandicoot never went away? Yeah, and that, that one was a little weird. It was an yeah. interesting sort of thing to, to segue. But, but he does, I think, bring up an interesting point of, like, you know, when people are like, Pac-Man's back, and it's like, Pac-Man never left. Yeah. Pac-Man, you know, we can't be nostalgic for... Mario. For Zelda. Like, that's, Zelda. it's always yeah. been here. And, you know, even the older games, like, the stuff has always been around. It's not faded away in I any think capacity. That, I think that connects back to the whole remembering the good things more fondly. Yeah. Because in terms of Sonic, everybody just remembers the first couple games, and they're like, oh, I wish, you know? <laughs> Personally, they, they I remember that. Sonic Battle 2, Sonic yeah. Adventures Battle 2, but, they, you know, they all, that's they my all life. They all want that original feeling, and even though he's been here the whole time, it hasn't sat, they, they've never gotten that or that first feeling again. Can we can we have an episode on the uh, uh, Sonic 06 real just real quick? <laughs> just, just just slap one in right in the middle of the Just a mini sode about Sonic 06. About th- that garbage <laughs> fire that is Sonic 06. Yeah. Oh boy. But it is kind of interesting cuz cuz I was thinking like being nostalgic for a Sonic is a weird thing because they've literally never stopped making Sonic games. Yeah. You know, they, they've they never stopped making Mario games. So, like, is that nostalgia, even? You know, to be nostalgic for Banjo-Kazooie is one thing, because that was, like, there was Banjo-Kazooie, Banjo-Tooie, then bye-bye. Like, yeah. no more. There was supposed to be a third one. And Banjo-3E. Yep. <laughs> Which is a terrible name. That's the joke. <laughs> it's a terrible name. But, like, what even is nostalgia anymore if, like, it's all we're consuming? If, if there isn't any distance you know how can you be homesick when you're still at home mm. yeah <laughs> oh, Big it's questions. A, i know i'm not sure like that's one to just ponder exactly. i think it, it makes me almost think it's it's almost becoming just straight up desire rather than like its own specific nostalgia like well, you, it, you just desire a very specific thing that to, to yeah i don't go, know back to the sort of comfort food metaphor it's like and you know certainly 
you consume whatever media you want to because that's our whole thing here that's our jam like whatever you like and whatever you want to do that's totally valid and and you should but it, it it strikes me as being sort of analogous to like just wanting to eat garbage food all the time <laughs> you know where you're just like yeah. i like i like mashed potatoes so i'm just gonna keep eating mashed potatoes and, and you know you can't really claim like oh boy like i miss mashed potatoes because <laughs> you just it's like but you just you had mashed potatoes yesterday like <laughs> Like, and so I, I mean, maybe it's like, it's sure, if that's like what you want to do with your life, you go out and eat your mashed potatoes. Um, but like, to bring it back to what it's a metaphor for, like, you're not, you're not getting new experiences and you're not sort of broadening your horizons if all you're eating is mashed potatoes. <laughs> <laughs> what movies are mashed potatoes? Just for, just well, to complete this reference. Well, for me yeah. or for everyone? No, for everyone. I don't know what everyone's mashed potato movie is. That's oh. that's a very individual thing. Okay. Uh, Princess Diaries. Is that your mashed potatoes movie? Well, no, I would say that's a universal one. Clearly. Um, Diaries? <laughs> yes! Just... Maybe Princess Bride, but not Princess Diaries. No, see, oh. the thing is, like, Dylan, we're weird. We're a little... I mean, like, yeah, everybody likes Princess Bride, but, like... It's a little bit of an older generation than us. Like, that movie yeah. came out... Like, what year... Did that even come out? Were we even born... I have actually no idea. That came out in, like, the late 80s, didn't it? I didn't see it until I was in college. Oh, boy. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> like, we grew up watching it. We had the VHS tape. But, like, that's before our time. Oh, I guess Star Wars would be the mashed potatoes. Yeah. Maybe. Maybe. Yeah. And, boy, oh, boy, did we just have a mashed potato fest last time, so... <laughs> oh, we were just stuffed. <laughs> uh, I think. I think we have a new phrase for this show it's your mashed potatoes yeah yeah what yeah my mashed potatoes <laughs> is probably pirates of the caribbean yeah. that's okay. my mashed potatoes movie do you have a mashed potatoes movie dylan i don't think i do i'm princess bride i guess that was the first thing that i thought of so that's so funny, probably you don't really watch it that much no, I don't. but you don't eat a lot of mashed potatoes either no and you don't watch fucking pirates of the caribbean very much you know i i mean i i'm a person who just rewatches movies a lot yeah. anyway but like i have watched that movie like a thousand times in my life you have <laughs> i've definitely watched it more times than you've watched princess bride yeah you're right <laughs> i think mine i i just said princess diaries because i thought it was universally loved by all <laughs> i think it is but okay <laughs> But my number think... one is actually uh, the Fifth Element. That's okay. Oh, that's good. Yeah, I think we found our like Venn diagram mashed potato, that's right? That's pretty good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but okay. Here's the thing, though. Like, there's a reason that people want to go back to this stuff, and I think part of it is just because, like, you only got so many hours in a day. I know that you, Dylan, you will devote every hour of your free time to finding new and exciting video games to play. But, like, some people are like, I got, like, maybe two hours a week that I'm willing to spend on video games. I want to go to something that I trust, something oh, that yeah. I feel like is going to be worth my time. I don't want to go out there and find some new thing and gamble on it. And that's why all these, you know nostalgic properties are so big across and that's media why nintendo <clears throat> and blizzard and whoever else you mentioned uh, just continued making sequels instead of developing new ips because yeah from a marketing standpoint it's yeah. oh i, mean, I want to talk want... about nintendo and their marketing for a while <laughs> yeah and okay well let's do that then okay so where are the switches? That's my question. Exactly. Where are the Nintendo exactly. switches? Where are the Give switches? me one. <laughs> I don't want one, but anytime I hear there's a rumor of one, I want to go buy it just so somebody I can like help somebody get it. You know? <laughs> Actually, that's what so many, Dylan's friend so did. He's in so Utah. Badly. That's true. Yeah, Dylan's friend was in Utah and found one and bought it so that Dylan could have one. Yeah. My my switch is gonna be delivered from Utah to California to here. <laughs> it's a long journey for a Switch. I I expect them to just be able to go to Walmart and get a console. But no, it has to come from Utah? What and and I think if, if we're talking about the Switch, um, it has a lot of nostalgia. Not necessarily into the its conception as a console, but 
the first game that anybody wanted was Zelda, Zelda. even though I would argue that it's not even really a Zelda game. Ooh. It's it's certainly one of the less Zelda y Zeldas yeah. to come out. Yeah, it's I... it, it, if you if you slap some different paint on it, it could be something completely different. It's very true, and I, I think that's awesome. Yeah, but th- I mean the... that's what you were hoping for with ukulele, exactly. right? Exactly. But at the same time, I think that that was a return to Zelda One for the NES. Interesting point. I I think that I can see what you're getting at there. Zelda One, you get you can miss getting the sword in Zelda One. <laughs> you can accidentally not have a sword <laughs> for the entirety of Zelda yeah, One. Yeah, you're just free to run around and do, you... do whatever you are able to do. Exactly, and that freedom. Well, you know, these days that would be considered a flaw that you can that you can forget your main weapon. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't make it out of playtesting normally. But, you know, it's something that they wanted to capture again with Breath of the Wild. Was, what you know, what's stopping you from fighting Ganon? Nothing. Just Are, your own capabilities. Can you fight him? <laughs> then do it. Like, and they really, wanted, they really wanted to force people to not have a weapon because they're constantly breaking. Hmm. Yeah. Try new things, find new stuff, explore. Yep. And that, it's that, that original, it was the first game that felt open world was Zelda for the NES where you just get thrown into <laughs> the original sandbox game. <laughs> exactly. It, it it was pretty crazy for its time that it opened up the whole world to you and and the ways that it locked things away were, you know, you didn't have a bomb yet. You needed more bombs. You don't have this key, so you go get a key. It wasn't you know, this is level 1, this is level 2. It wasn't two. invisible walls. Exactly. It, wasn't... it was oh, I ran into this thing that I can't get past because I need a key. Like, I ran across a locked door. I guess I need a key. And then you go and you search for a key. And that's, you know, that's become kind of a staple of a lot of genres now where they will, I mean, you know, vet- Metroidvanias and things like that, they mm-hmm. they almost taunt you with, like, treasure behind, a, a like, a window pane or something, but there's no door. So it's like, well, what, how do I get it? And, you know, you have to travel around the level and find a secret vent or something. I, I'm thinking about Doom mostly. <laughs> but um, that sort of, that freedom that, that other games weren't doing at the time. And Zelda almost stopped doing after Zelda 1. Because mm-hmm. in Ocarina of Time, there's only two temples that you can do in a different order or something like that can you even i don't know i'm pretty very few i'm pretty sure ocarina of time you just you there's a sequence and that's it the well and the shadow temple are they are are are, you you can do them in any it's been a long time since i've played that part in the game yeah but other than that it's it's pretty much linear yeah Link, link to the past can you do it you can can you play that in different orders? You can. You can, and then A Link Between Worlds, you you can, can. again. Yeah. And A Link Between Worlds was, I think, uh, almost them um, testing the waters I'm with going so back to that. I'm so glad they did. Exactly. I love that game. <laughs> um, what else did you have to say, Alex, about Nintendo? Nintendo. We got on um, a kind of a sidebar. <laughs> the NES Classic. Oh, no. Release. Um, I mean, it's it's... A nostalgia box that you buy, yeah. <laughs> um, and it was, in in some ways, you know, not even a good purchase because, like, a, you know, the cord length for the controller and that sort of thing. <laughs> also, yeah. not being able to find one, just like the Switch. But I would say it was worse because it was during the holidays and I worked retail, so it was. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, working in a big box store at that time of year. You learn things. People are still calling about the NES Classic, and I'm like, A, the Switch is out, and they want to pour all their, you know... Their uh, effort into that. that. Yeah. Um, and especially because it has, you know, the e-console, which you can just download all those classic games. Yeah. I mean, you have to pay for them, but yeah. And then, also, they're coming out with the Super NES Classic, or Super Nintendo Classic. Yeah. Yep. So... Did, didn't uh, they just discontinue uh, the NES Classic? 
I'm sure they did, but that's not stopping people from calling about it. Exactly. <laughs> but even that, you know, it, it, it shows that they want that. You know, they want that shortage. They don't want to give everyone an NES Classic. They... Do you suppose that's doing anything for them? Well, if I you don't sell think 100% so. of your stock, you, yeah. you it's pretty easy to gauge your profits. So there's that. Yeah, I don't, I but, don't know. But I don't... I don't I think it I think honestly it probably is is working for the limited time holiday NES classic. I think it's a terrible idea for the Switch. Yeah, I, yeah. I think that I think that that's a, a, a fair point. Yeah. I think but yeah. I mean the thing is well, let's let's talk about the Starbucks unicorn frappuccino. Let's talk about that. <laughs> we tried one the other day. If you make something limited run no matter how unlikely someone is to normally want it, I that was the first time I went into Starbucks in uh, maybe a year. <laughs> and it was to try this thing that I was going to miss out on if I didn't try it. So, you know, they don't want to appear as though that's what they're doing. Yeah. But I, but, think, I, mean, everybody I think that's what they're doing. Is they aren't making as many as they know they need to so that it does become a limited item well and and i think that like alex said with something you know like a special limited time thing like that you know the nes classic whatever you know that's a good thing to do with a unicorn frappuccino where you're like we're just gonna do this weird thing yeah. because maybe it's not something we could sell all the time maybe it's not something normally we could sell a lot of but if we make it a hot commodity if we make people desire it by triggering their like fomo then you know then we'll, we'll do a lot more business but the switch is is their new console like that's gonna that's what they're banking on for a couple of years now like it's not something that they're like get it while it lasts like th they should be selling more remember the wii i mean the wii u was a total how long, Carbuncle. <laughs> how long did the Wii U last? Do we? I don't know. Not long enough, and years? and and honestly, longer than it should have. Well, <laughs> that's a that's a way I don't like putting it. But yeah, like I wish that they had made more games for it. I wish that they had used it. But I'm I'm surprised it lasted as long as it did. Well, yeah. It, like, back to what you were talking about, like the Wii. What like they were littering the floors of every retail store. You could get well, one. Then they all got know, bought up. Like, everyone had a Wii in their living room. Everyone had a Wii. It was great. It was cool. And everyone was like, wow, Nintendo, they really won this time. Like, they did it. Yeah. They sold all the consoles and made all the money because they made enough consoles and everybody wanted one. And I think that the Switch could have been that. Maybe not quite the success of the Wii, but it would have definitely been done better than the Wii U. I think they were just scared. I think it could be, yeah. I'm wondering if they're almost changing their approach to consoles entirely by making a shorter lifespan for a console on purpose. Like a, a really extreme planned obsolescence? Yeah. I, I think I can sort of understand that, especially because they don't necessarily make a ton of their own games. Yeah. I wish they did. <laughs> I, we all wish they did. Um <laughs> But like, you know, Microsoft and Sony, they, you know, put out a lot of games themselves or they produce them in some way. And yeah. or they, they buy up things like Minecraft and stuff like that. Whereas Nintendo, it's like they're all, they're 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 more focused on their hardware. They're more focused on their peripherals. <laughs> yeah. Expansion ports, man. <laughs> Rumble packs. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know and it is kind of interesting thinking about like because uh, you know a lot of this was talking about how um part of this sort of f fear of developers to make new things is that a lot of people are switching over to playing mobile everything is going mobile now and people with less time want to play mobile games and so that's why we've got a mobile game mario we got a mobile game all of this we got mobile pokemon we got we had all these things that you Fire loved him. growing up, Fire Emblem, everything you loved as a kid, um, you can now play on your iPhone. And gosh darn it, phones have a pretty short lifespan. They do, yeah. I mean, I've 
been thinking about buying a new phone myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your phone's pretty old. It is. Yeah, like, people... Yeah, that that is sort of an interesting idea that maybe it's got a short lifespan on, on purpose. I don't know. I guess we'll have to see with the Switch what they want to do with it. Because if they, you know, if that happens twice in a row, that's, that's starting to form a pattern. Well, and their, their next release, it was either this past... Friday or it's this Friday is Mario Kart, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. Mario Kart. Target's getting all crazy for it, isn't it? <laughs> well, there was, a, there was a, I think it was Huffington Post was posting about how Targets are getting uh, cart themed carts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and like displays at the toy, in, the, in electronics and at the, at the uh, entrance. But that's like uh, the big fancy Targets. Yeah. Mm. Uh, is a show off he targets. Yeah, well, and, and like the special carts, they're 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 a different kind of cart than my store even has. We still have the old metal ones, whereas a lot of the newer stores have like oh, the. You do. The thick you don't even have the red plastic ones. ones? Nope. You. <laughs> <laughs> How I, can they do that? When I when I first switched to this store, I was like, oh, this is kind of different. I hated them at first, but I I kind of like them. They're nostalgic. No. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> it's like we have a theme yeah there's like a i feel like there's a theme happening in this episode yeah. like there's a real point that we're getting at here <laughs> but like i mean when it really comes down to it like we 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 the people are are very much to blame for <laughs> for all the nostalgia that's we going around we keep buying it we we're the, we keep making it like Indie games, man, the vast majority of them are just people trying to make a game like that game that they like. Um, in fact, I mean, there are some pretty great examples of that, you know, things that really did elevate, like um, River City Ransom Underground. You know, that's a sequel, <laughs> long-awaited yeah. sequel to a game from the 80s that just rocks. It's really, really good. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a very fresh and fun take on that game. Yeah, it suffered from a lot of technical difficulties at launch, but thanks to the magic of patching, we're we're getting to a, a real, a real gem of a game. It, the writing is stellar. It is. It's a good time. They and captured it's... all of the things that made the original awesome while also expanding upon it. Yeah, yeah. Which is which is I think what we really want. Like if you're gonna exactly. do it, if you're gonna do it, if you're gonna reach back and and you know pull out some gem from the past, like. Do, do it, something else, too. Do it justice and expand upon it. Yeah. Well, and that's what yeah. a lot of games, especially indie games, are doing right now, are they're using, like, pixel art yeah. to sort yeah. of... And they just use that style, and then they have a completely new game that has never been in that style before. And I've been seeing some stuff where people are actually sort of using a, a, an older style of graphics for sort of computational purposes you know if you're you, you do a low poly count then it's you're gonna ta have lower load times it's gonna be just a lot easier to program um but people have been like taking that and saying like okay well what can we do with it like how can we have these low polys but still make something beautiful and i've seen some really lovely lovely stuff done within those limitations Either of you ever seen uh, Team Fortress 2? Uh, somebody made uh, low-poly models of all of the characters no. um, that still maintain their unique uh, uh, silhouettes and all of that. That sounds fascinating. It's, it's, it's amazing. It looks so good. <laughs> it, it's, it looks like uh, TF2 came out on the N64, but it's, it is... <laughs> It's gorgeous. Like, it's, it's its own thing. It's crazy. So, like, there is great stuff to be done within those confines of, like, nostalgic-looking stuff, you mm -hmm. know. And there, there are very practical reasons to go back to that. You know, it's easier to make a video game with pixel art. Like, people who otherwise would not ha not be able to make a video game, they can, they can do it that way, and it's a lot more attainable. Yeah, it's budgetarily, you know... It's Easier. it's actually a feasible thing for just anybody to do, and of course, if you and you're like, I'm gonna make a video game. This is a project that I'm gonna do for myself and my fun. 
you're gonna you're gonna pick something close to your heart. You're not gonna probably go and do something, especially if you're if you are just still learning. Like you're gonna base it on something familiar to you. You're gonna go back and yeah. you're gonna learn. I mean, you know, when you're learning to draw, you you paint from the masters. You go back and you say, okay, what did he do? How do I do it? And that's how you learn. Speaking of, you know, that that kind of you know sequels new you know like river city ransom underground making <laughs> making new sequels to very old games did shinmu 3 ever come out uh it's still in development as Is far it? as i know yeah it got crowdfunded it got crowdfunded it got the very... heck out of it <laughs> yeah i was looking into that one it raised uh two million dollars in eight hours and by the end, it raised more than six million dollars. Yeah, it it blew Tim Schafer's mustache right off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean that's just astounding. So it is still in the works. It is, yeah. Because what Shinmu Two came out in like two thousand and two, right? Yeah, that was uh, on original Xbox. And it was a weird game. Yeah, Shinmu's pretty great. Well, there's a reason they crowdfunded it. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's another one of those situations. I mean, if if Half Life Three popped up on on Kickstarter, how much money do you think that would make? I can't even fathom. Because that's part of it. Is Shenmue Three was supposed to happen, yeah, and didn't, and so <laughs> maybe yeah, that's that's all that Gabe's waiting for. He's just like, I don't have the money to make it. <laughs> I'm sorry, guys. I'm just really uh. broke. It's very expensive to make Half Life Three. <laughs> that's my Gabe voice. That was terrible. <laughs> I don't know what he sounds like, so I'm just making it up. <laughs> Are you excited for Kingdom Hearts 3? Or do you feel like it's something that doesn't need to be uh, made? I, I would be excited if it were to ever come out. <laughs> <laughs> Those third sequels, man, they just... They don't come well, out. Well, okay, so they, they have some good games in hidden amongst all that, like, point two and, and junk. <laughs> Like, one over 30 days i don't even remember what that one's called yeah that's what? just a movie that's all that one is it's a movie <laughs> is it really like they released they, re they released it for the ps4 or it might have been ps3 i can't remember where i got it but it was uh it was in a collection with um the psp game that they were re releasing on the console and it they just released the cutscenes because it wasn't a full game wow <laughs> yeah it's it, yeah, we I we played one and two, right? I don't think we played any further. We didn't play very much of one and two. No, we didn't. We just had them. Yeah. You don't need to play. Well, there are a couple that are fun, but like, there's no unless you like are a historian, you can't keep up with that story. <laughs> it's pretty cray. Yeah, I have to like con every couple months. I have to like watch a video on YouTube like explaining it all just so I can keep it straight. <laughs> It's Metal Gear-esque. Yeah, I was going to say that. <laughs> okay, but what do you guys make of the nostalgia implications of mashing up Disney and Final Fantasy? Because, <laughs> like, that's a lot going a lot on nostalgia. there. <laughs> a lot of nostalgia. I think that's why it's, I mean, not what, the only reason why it's successful, but I think that's certainly a factor. I mean, I don't necessarily love all the disney characters when you when they come back some of them can be kind of annoying especially as yeah. an adult i just the reason why i just couldn't quite latch on to kingdom hearts is because i just can't deal with taking mickey donald and goofy seriously as rpg characters i can't i can't do it i can't feel that way about them <laughs> The funny thing is, Donald and Goofy are so out of place, but they try so hard to make Mickey into this, like, badass, mysterious But he's still got that like, Mickey voice! Oh, exactly! <laughs> I can't. I can't. <laughs> and so, like, you know, the other bits of it look fine. They do. But I, I can't. But that's such a big part of it that I just, I just, could, that's just an obstacle that I couldn't get over <laughs> I think you would probably enjoy, um, I can't even think of which title it is, because there's so many different ones, but it's the one with uh, the three characters, and you get to pick which one you play as. Gosh, I wasn't even aware that was a thing. And they're all original characters, and the start of the game is entirely original characters, and you sort of venture out um, 
and and go to Disney and, and Final Fantasy Worlds, but it's it's definitely much more focused on the original characters than than the classic characters. Yeah, I just, I, yeah, because I find it very, very jarring to have this, like, original JRPG story, and then it's like, here's Aladdin, and I'm like, mm-hmm. what are you doing here? I can't, I can't, yeah, I mean, and, like, clearly, there were plenty of people for whom that was not an issue, but for me, it's just an issue. Like, I, I, I'll keep my, I'll keep my fandom separate. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it is a weird, it was a weird choice. To go with original characters and like this whole like the the nobodies thing and how like it's it's got a lot going on in its lore. <laughs> it doesn't need Disney and Final Fantasy. Yeah, it has its own its own exactly. Issues like out. I don't really it, it I don't. What get is, it. Yeah, what was that like? Why was that? Why was it? I don't know. It the way it felt at the time when I was playing the original was. Uh, that it like there wasn't gonna be much going on with these original characters. They were just kind of. It felt like baby's first JRPG. Yeah, they were just kind of there, and it was like you get to explore these things. But then as the series went on, they go they got further and further from. Yeah, it it, it seemed like the JRPG where you go into Disney stories, and yeah. it's like okay, that's the concept is like yeah. Now we're going into Disney. Uh, cool, fun. I, I it's Winnie the Pooh. But <laughs> but they made their own whole thing. And at that point, it's just it's it feels it felt like too much to me. Like yeah, they were definitely re- they were definitely you lost focus they, or they lost focus on the Disney and the Final Fantasy yeah. because it just got so complicated in its own story. Like with yeah. Organization Thirteen, the hooded figures. Like it's just golly. You have to you have to be like a quantum physicist to figure it out. I'm not. Kidding. <laughs> yeah. Well, gosh. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. Yeah, well, yeah. Like I said, clearly it works for a lot of people. It sure does. Clearly, clearly. Like Sonic. Sonic, and I feel like there's a lot of crossover between these groups. <laughs> no commentary supplied. I think there's a lot of crossover between those groups. <sighs> Gosh, sure. normally we, we we would have more to more to say, but I I'm am not... so just like out of it. <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. Anything uh, you want to add that I can stick in there, Dillion? Mm. I mean, we could we could touch upon Mighty Number no. Nine. Let's touch upon ni- Mighty Number no. Nine, and I may take that bit and shove it backwards because <laughs> boy, we've got a lot of nonsense in here that's probably going to make it into a very strange bonus episode. Yeah. Lots of Kingdom Hearts. Can and you Sonic remind now. me about Mighty Number no. Nine? It sounds so familiar. It is uh, what ukulele. As as ukulele is to Banjo Kazooie, Mighty Number no. Nine is to Mega Man. Um, oh right, right, right. Keiji Unifune, the one of the original creators of Mega Man, uh, kickstarted Mighty Number no. Nine, which uh, quickly sprung into a franchise type deal and got a cartoon and all sorts of crap. Um, and then the game came out and it wasn't very good. <laughs> yeah, I remember being really underwhelmed. Um, and a lot of that had to do, in my opinion, with taking the wrong things from the original. Hmm. Um, it did what ukulele did, which was it wanted to... Just do it again. Do it again. And it even went so far as to, hey, here's a new mechanic to, to go in with that. And it had the whole dashing absorb nonsense. Um, I don't know if I like it as <laughs> a mechanic. It's kind of weird. Um but it was a new mechanic, and it also it, it it was a mechanic that appealed to the type of people that were still playing Mega Man speedrunners. Mm-hmm. Um, and but it also drew a lot of the pacing issues and overcomplication of Mega Man X and Mega Man X Two and mm-hmm. and all that, which are amazing games. Mm-hmm. But they suffered in a way that Mega Man didn't from trying to explain themselves too much. Mm. And, and and they they ruined the, what was a very seamless and, and fluid experience 
into I'm like mid jump and there's a dialogue box that just popped up and is talking about Mega Man, Mega Man. Mega Man, Mega Man. <laughs> you gotta you go fight the stuff and do the things. Yeah. It's like I know it's on the right side of the screen and I'm on the left side of the screen. Thanks, I can, Navi. I can figure it out. <laughs> and there's like just the whole beginning of Mighty Number no. Nine is dialogue and. You know, so is the beginning of ukulele. <laughs> yes. I'm, I'm wondering if it's... This is really pessimistic, but... <laughs> I'm wondering if... These game creators... Just... I mean, it's sort of like resting on their laurels. They haven't needed to improve upon their ideas or... Or their understanding of the gaming industry because they had such success earlier you know in the past I think definitely yeah yeah dylan and i were actually talking about that the other day um i was i had read a while back about um sort of this quagmire that the final fantasy development team got into where they ended up getting so wrapped up in themselves and thinking we're the final fantasy development team we don't need to you know improve like yeah. we're the we're the guys like we can do whatever we want. We're so great, and they ended up kind of losing their way for a while there, um, because they just didn't feel the need to stay sharp. And that yeah. sort of, um, I think, loops back into what we were talking a lot about last week, or I don't know, last <laughs> whenever episode. we were talking <laughs> last episode with you know new blood in in whatever media industry that you're in. We we're talking about diversity of of creators and how their stories w will only improve the overall set. I don't know. I've lost. No. The yeah. Oh, like yeah, like broadens the horizons for everyone. Yeah. Exactly. New, yeah. Rising more experiences. Tide all ships. Yeah. It's <laughs> a good one. <laughs> but yeah, so you think that maybe Mighty Number no. Nine was suffering from that? I don't know. The way it felt to me was almost like he felt like one of the flaws was one of the strengths almost that like he thought people were really into like the lore and the characters he created and... so um he pulled a george lucas would you say <laughs> that's almost what it felt like yeah it is it's a fundamental misunderstanding of his property and what people kind, liked about it kind of yeah uh... and it yeah nobody Gives a crap about Mega Man lore. No. Except for the Proto Men. But Proto they make up their own. The, yeah, they made it up. <laughs> 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 are, are you familiar with the Proto Men, Alex? No. <laughs> they, they're a band, and they're great. Okay. And they wrote a two part rock opera that is the story of how Mega Man came to be. <laughs> and it's okay. really good. You should go and listen to it. <laughs> There, it's like a two-part story. The it's like a, a sort of, gosh, one of them just takes place like during Mega Man, right? Like the first one is like just the story of Mega Man, sort of. Yes. And then the second one is like a like a prequel, which is like the story of Doctor Light and Doctor Wily when they were young men and they were scientists together and like how this whole thing even began. And it's so good, Alex. It's so good. <laughs> You need to go and listen to this. This is a plug right here. Go listen to the Proto Men, everybody. <laughs> Act two, the father of death. The father of it's death. A good album. Okay, but what about um, God, what was the one the the Castlevania? That's not oh, Castlevania. Oh, uh, Bloodstained. Yeah. Ritual of the Night. That um is looking very good. It's still not out. It's not out yet. God, it's it's quite a ways out actually. Gosh, I um, guess I mean it's just it's just so unusual to see. A video games development from like the ground floor so it feels yeah. like it should be out by now but that's just because i heard about it way early yeah i i want to say it wasn't that it was like two years ago yeah that feels like a long time for me really but that's because i don't track video games the way that you do <laughs> yeah um it's it's coming along very well and they're uh doing new things and expanding upon well good original, yeah well, uh, that's something to look forward to then because definitely 
Maybe we'll maybe we'll get another one of those ones that does it right. Yeah. They're also very focused on on all aspects of like they are trying to create a more original art style and so they're creating a new graphics engine that hmm. does what they want it to do and and it has its own look that yeah, it's very they're going all out. Hmm. I suppose in closing, I just wonder how you guys feel about sort of this this nostalgia wave that's that's going on like do you feel like it's ultimately innocuous do you feel like it's a problem i i think it'll get annoying really quickly especially with all the like the, the disney remakes and and every everything i mean we, everything's already remixed so it's going to even be you know it's starting to get out of hand. So. Yeah, and I, I, it's sort of uncharted territory for us since this is the first time we're experience this, experiencing this pile on of nostalgia, whereas, you know, other generations might have seen this come and go. And, you know, that actually reminds me, I feel like we may be the first generation with good games to be nostalgic about. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, people aren't really going to look back on Pong you, you know, like, it's just, it's like, you're not gonna, like, fondly, you know, not the way that, that we can look back and be like, oh man, playing Perfect Dark when I was a kid, you know, growing up playing Ocarina of Time was so magical, like, I feel like the games that we grew up with are better suited to remember? It's, I think it's a different... I, as... I think it's probably because they have stories. Yeah, as as media, yes, I think so. But because they finally became their own their own media. Exactly. Mm -hmm. But I think they you know just... when people go back and they remember yeah. Pong, they remember the technological leap yeah. for mankind that was Pong. Yeah. They, they don't remember necessarily Yeah. You know, you, they don't, you don't necessarily want to go back and play Pong. Yeah, but it was like that was mind blowing. Yeah. <laughs> to... So so it's a different it's a different it sort is. of thing because you're not necessarily nostalgic for the thing. It's just more of like I was there. I was... Yeah, exactly. Which but... which isn't exactly nostalgic. It's different. But... Yeah. Yeah. So like for us, we we we've, we've got a real good swath of games to look back on and be nostalgic for from our whole yeah. lives. I would say uh, to compare it to movies you don't go back and see the first moving pictures and you're like, oh, those were the days. That was a good one. Yeah, I <laughs> exactly. Oh, no, that's, oh, that's they an excellent did that. Version. They figured it out. Yeah. And then once they get into like the story-driven silent yeah. films, you know, that's when you're like, oh, that's when it was the shit. Nosferatu is a good movie. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, that one with the train, you're not necessarily going to pop that one in and rewatch <laughs> it. <laughs> That's too scary. It's, it's just so, so it's much scarier than Nosferatu. <laughs> it's very scary, so that's why people aren't going to watch it. Well, what's your take, though, Dylan? What's your sort of takeaway? I've always viewed it as a little bit lazy. Yeah, to, sure. To, to remake things. Like, I mean, and... but is that necessarily a problem? Yes, it doesn't allow... If you're not expanding... I, I don't I think you're gonna run into stagnation um, and I think you need innovation fair point and like we've seen with too many now uh, if you're drawing upon something established you can feel like you don't need to innovate yeah whereas you know if you're making a new JRPG or something someone's gonna eventually ask well like why should people play this one what's what's our thing mm -hmm. and it's like why should people play ukulele well because they play banjo kazooie so yeah i mean yeah why should we see jurassic world because, because you like Jura jurassic park it's jurassic park again like, you like jurassic park. yeah everyone who saw that is gonna see this <laughs> they have their market there whereas... yeah well yeah i mean you know that movie came out when we were little kids and now you know people you know that were little kids when that came out have little kids of their own and they're gonna say oh yeah let's go and do that again and yeah. i'll be the grown-up this time yeah <laughs> and and it just doesn't in a way where you would almost be forced to, to innovate if you're creating something new um, you don't get that so much with a remake hmm. 
Yeah. I think. Fair point. And I just, I, I really like innovation. <laughs> <laughs> well, when you're playing video games five hours a day, then I can imagine things would start to get old. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, gentlemen. Well, I think we are ready to wrap it up if you feel the same way. Yep. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining me in this closet, Dylan. Thank you so much for having me in this closet, actually. For making a trip across the hallway (laughs) here. It really means a lot to us. Uh, No, this was super fun. Thanks for coming on. I think we would love to have you back again someday. Cool. Yeah, I'd love to. Be, I'd love to do it. Rad. It was awesome meeting you, Alex. <laughs> yeah, nice to meet you too. That does it for today's episode. Thanks for listening. Please subscribe to us on YouTube if you absolutely love us, and like this video if you only like us. And thanks to Jonathan Colton for the use of our theme song "Fraud" from his album "Artificial Heart." Until next time, remember, no, no guilty, guilty pleasures. pleasures.